Okay, I'm back at it again, and today we are going to be discussing Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. It's the fourth film. This already marks halfway through the series. Four more movies to go, and three more books. Alright, so right off the bat, this movie is the moment where Harry Potter is no longer a children's story. I mean, yeah, The Prisoner of Azkaban was relatively dark compared to Philosopher's Stone and The Chamber of Secrets, but The Goblet of Fire is where things are just... This is just the moment where you're like, yeah, being Harry Potter is not good. This is not a children's story. Cedric dies! And Bella won't get Edward. Boy, that's the wrong franchise. Okay, so right off the bat, the first chapter definitely corresponds with the first scene in the movie, considering the first chapter is actually about Harry's dream about Lord Voldemort. Yeah, I, I don't even know why I'm still calling him Lord at this point. I mean, he failed to kill a baby, and he's still failing to kill a teenager. Not to mention when he failed to kill Harry when he was 11. Why do people still follow him? And then you have the Quidditch World Cup, or as I like to call it, Missed Opportunity. I mean, it was already a great setup. You already had Crom and the two Quidditch teams, and it was already great, and they were all cheering, and then you've got Cornelius. I mean, it was, also, I mean, it was already a great setup. You already had the teams, and then Crom and then Cornelius Fudge, and then suddenly when he's... I mean, I really want to see the leprechauns and the feelings. Not to mention the actual game! We need more Quidditch scenes! And then in the following scene where you've got the dark mark all the way up there, they completely cut out Winky. Actually, they completely cut out Winky and SPEW. Society for the Protection... Society for the... Society... Society for the Protection of Elfish Welfare. Dumbledore said calmly. It was perfectly clear that Dumbledore said calmly. And yet you have this. Harry! I do everything is a conspiracy theory! I protest! Harry! I protest! Harry, you put your name in the cupboard of the fire. No, sir. You asked one of the oldest students to do it for you? No, sir. You're absolutely sure? Yes, sir. He practically throttles Harry and Harry looks... He practically throttles Harry and Harry just looks absolutely terrified. I mean, to be fair, I would too. And then you've also got that moment where Sirius talks to Harry. That is not how flu works. When you use flu to talk to someone, you do not get turned into a piece of wood. You're supposed to just have your head just floating in there in the fire. You're not supposed to have your face turned into a log. And then you have the first task. Okay, to be fair, this is actually cool. Yeah, I mean, the first task definitely deviated from the books. The dragon did not break free and then chase Harry all around the castle. I mean, it was definitely an awesome scene, and I was on the edge of my seat, but still, actually, props to them, it was actually a pretty cool scene. But that's immediately ruined when I find out that apparently they were supposed to have the Forbidden Forest burned down. No. As dangerous as the Forbidden Forest is, it is an integral part of the series. That's where Grawl hides. That's where the Acromantial Colony is. That's where Harry dies at the end. So you cannot have it burned down. Alright, and the next thing we have is Ferret Draco. Okay, this was definitely a scene that I absolutely enjoyed. I mean, just look at Draco being turned into a ferret. It's just, that mental image is never leaving. But, I mean, when you actually look at it, it's hilarious, yeah, but it must have been pretty traumatizing for him. I mean, imagine getting turned into a ferret in front of a crowd and being shoved down someone's pants. Yeah, suffice to say, I'd be as furious as he was in that scene. Alright, now we've got the Yule Ball. It was actually a really great scene that I really enjoyed. And while most people would say that Hermione's gown is different from the books in the films, I mean, I actually really like her gown. It's really nice. I mean, as great as it is to picture Hermione in periwinkle robes, I just think that this dress is just so gorgeous. My only complaint in this scene is that they didn't have any Draco. I wanted to see Draco. Give me more Draco. And... yeah. <laughs> and the next thing that I've got to go to is the third task. Actually, I'm 
kind of conflicted about what I think about third time. On the one hand, it was actually really foreboding, especially that moment where Dumbledore says that you may just lose yourselves. I mean, really, you can just see Fleur's reaction. Not to mention, you would also be creeped if you were stuck in a maze like that. I mean, yeah, I wish there was the Sphinx and the Blast Ended Scrooots and the Acromantulas, but I think that the film did pretty well. I mean, it would have done better if they'd actually included that and incorporated that extremely terrifying maze that actually sort of came to life, but it was actually quite good. Speaking of Fleur, she's a really underappreciated character. I especially got so annoyed in Half-Blood Prince when Ginny started calling Fleur Flem, and Hermione, Molly, and Ginny just all hated on her. Really, Fleur is just an amazing character and I wish we had seen more. I mean, you're not giving her enough credit in the first test. She managed to put the dragon to sleep. Well, it takes at least four grown men to try and wrangle a dragon. And those wizards specialize in dragons, okay? And yet Floor managed to make it fall asleep single-handedly. The only thing that went wrong was that her skirt caught on fire. Really, she deserves more credit. Okay, I forgot to mention this, but here's one thing that I need to go to before we discuss the graveyard. Marty Crapsy. In the books, he was fully present most of the time. Percy kept showing up for him because he was under the Imperious Curse by his son, Barty Crouch Jr., when he had managed to break free from his father's Imperious Curse. And really, the fact that he had somehow managed to think that Mad-Eye Moody was actually an imposter who was Barty Crouch Jr., I mean, he was right all along, but is just no. I mean, the weird tongue thing that they did is just... Not to mention the fact that when they find his body, it is actually just Mr. Couch's body. The thing that actually happened was that when Barty Crouch Jr. killed his father, Barty Crouch Sr., he had transfigured his father's body into a bone, and his body was never found. And really, the fact that they just managed to find his body like that is just not to mention how he was with Victor Comfort, but here he is with Hagrid, Hermione, and Ron. Alright, time to go to one of the best scenes ever. The Graveyard. Okay, I have got to say, props to Ralph Phineas for managing to do this so brilliantly. Really, Voldemort was just absolutely terrifying in this installment. Actually, I think he was the most terrifying in this movie compared to the other films. I mean, Ralph Phineas did brilliantly in all of them, but I just think that with all of that energy and all of that enthusiasm for wanting to cruciate this carry is just absolutely amazing. Especially the amount of fear that Daniel Radcliffe shows, and the amount of pain and terror that's in his voice when he was screaming when Voldemort touched the scar. And actually, here's one thing that most people don't like. The fact that Voldemort has blue eyes in the film, while in the books he actually has red eyes. Now, while I don't have a preference, I think that it actually did a good job in the films because they managed to show that while Voldemort murders and tortures people for the fun of it, he's actually still human, shown by his blue eyes. Whereas if he has his demonic red eyes, it really just sort of cements the fact that this guy is not human. This guy cannot be human because no human would be able to do such a thing. But giving him blue eyes really just emphasizes the fact that yes, this is a human. Yes, humans like this exist. I mean, just look at Beltrix the Strange. Really just... My God. Not to mention that amazing priority and scene. Really, especially that moment where Lily just tells Harry that he's ready and that he should let go. It was just such a heartfelt moment. Another gut-wrenching scene is when you see Amos Diggory by Cedric's body. The heart-wrenching screams and sobs that he just lets out is just... Really, you see how much grief he has for having lost Cedric. After all, Cedric was just a spare. Speaking of the cup, I'm actually wondering why exactly Voldemort turned the Triwizard Cup into a two-way port key. He could have just made it a port key that went from Hogwarts all the way to the graveyard and not having it take someone from the graveyard all the way back to Hogwarts. Really, I'm just wondering why he made it so that he could go back. I mean, it can't have been that he was planning on going to Hogwarts through the port key because he was trying to lay low. It really, it's just something that keeps me wondering. As for the ending scene though, I think that Daniel Radcliffe's acting was absolutely brilliant and spot on. I really loved the way he acted, and while I really did wish that they had gotten the entire scene of his interrogation and the fact that he was given the Dementor's kiss because Cornelius Fudge was terrified of him, and the fact that he did that weird tongue thing again, 
the whole twist and Daniel Radcliffe's acting and just having Mad-Eye Moody, who is actually apparently Barty Crouch Jr., was just something that made up for it. Anyways, that's the end of another review. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, I would really appreciate it if you liked, shared, and subscribed. It would mean the absolute world to me, and I hope to see you in the next video. Uh, 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 uh.